welcome back to Plato's Cave. Today, I have John Martin Fisher joining me. He is a distinguished professor of philosophy at the University of California, Riverside, and he has been a, an incredibly prolific author on many topics over the past four decades, including free will and moral responsibility, which we'll talk about today, but also ethics and value, death and immortality, philosophy of religion, and he's done a massive amount of reviews, books, and a lot of edited volumes. So, John, thanks for uh, joining me today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I've always wanted to come to Plato's Cave, so <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll liberate your uh, viewers. But in any case, uh, thanks a lot, Jordan. Sure. Yeah, let's get started on the ascent. Um, so, so I invited you on today. I want to talk about um, a lot of um, what might seemingly be disparate topics in moral responsibility, but I, I'm going to use a, a paper of yours as kind of a a base of the conversation, but I, but I think it'll escape its scope. Um, and that paper is semi-compatibilism and its rivals, um, which is a very, it's a very cool paper because it's, um, it, it seems to me uh, to be at least like a, a very general kind of overview of your view and you contrast it to two salient others. Um, were you invited to do that by the Journal of Ethics or was this a, just a regular standalone paper? It's a good question, and frankly, I don't remember whether I was invited to or not, but it was a while ago, but I tried to make it a standalone paper. Mm. Yeah, it does, a, it does a great job of, um, you know, kind of introducing um, your view and, and like I said, contrasting it to two salient others, which um, I'm, I'm a fan of Frankfurt's for sure, so I'm, I'm interested to see how you view the disagreement there. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Well, if you, I, I can say a few things about the general issues there, and it might mm -hmm. take me a little while, but I try and make it quick. Semi-compatibilism is the doctrine that um, causal determinism is compatible with moral responsibility apart from the issue of how determinism bears on freedom to do otherwise. I hold that moral responsibility then doesn't require freedom to do otherwise. I, I follow Harry Frankfurt in that way, in his famous... 1969 paper, alternate uh, moral responsibility and alternate possibilities. Uh, where we differ uh, is in the positive characterization or the more explicit characterization of the kind of freedom that is required for moral responsibility. So freedom to do otherwise isn't according to both Frankfurt and me, but acting freely is. I use slightly different terminology. I, I I say regulative control is not required, but guidance control is required. Uh, but that's just a terminological point. Um, <clears throat> now we differ because Frankfurt defines acting freely in terms of a hierarchy in, in the mind and in our motivational state. So uh, he deems it crucial to uh, personhood that we can step back from our first order desires and form second order volitions, which are second order desires to act in accordance with a certain first order desire. And he defines acting freely in terms of acting from that motivational hierarchy in the right way. I define acting freely in terms of reasons responsiveness. So the agent, when she acts, if she's morally responsible, she acts from her own reasons responsive process or mechanism. So uh, we agree on some things and disagree on others. Let me put it that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, that's a really nice way of laying out the kind of um, differences between you two. Um, I wanted to start with, I mean, you, so you have some, some nice remarks in the beginning of the paper about the concept of moral responsibility itself. Um, and so I, sh I should say you're following up um, uh, Greg Caruso, um, he was just on the show, you know, to, to talk about his new book with Dan Dennett. Um, so you'll be a nice counterpoint to the sort of the, the moral responsibility skepticism that he has. Um, so actually on that note, I, I wanted to ask you about um, a kind of specific question about compatibilism. Um, I think that I had heard Tamler Summers from the University of Houston once classify compatibilism as, you know, if, if you're kind of an honest to God compatibilist you have to um, say that moral responsibility could be warranted in some circumstances above and beyond consequences because those are available to the skeptic too. Do you agree with that classification? Um, I, I'm not sure what 
you mean by oh, above and beyond consequences. In other words, we all think you can be morally responsible for your actions and for your omissions and for the consequences of your actions and omissions. So that's, but um, not sure what is meant by ab- above and beyond the consequences. Yeah, so he, I, I misspoke slightly there. I think he means above and beyond consequentialist reasonings for holding oh, yes. someone responsible. Yeah. Good, good. Um, I believe, and off the top of my head, I guess, I believe that compatibilism is consistent with a consequentialist account of moral responsibility or a non-consequentialist account. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, compatibilism simply is, and now you have to be clear on what you're alleging is compatible with what. You could have God's foreknowledge and freedom, God's foreknowledge and moral responsibility, causal determinism and freedom to do otherwise, causal determinism and acting freely, causal determinism and moral responsibility. So, but if you, let's just say compatibilism of the sort that I'm interested in is the doctrine that causal determinism is compatible with acting freely and therefore given that other conditions are met, like the epistemic condition, causal determinism is compatible with uh, moral responsibility. Now, moral responsibility and punishment are connected, although perhaps in in contested and complicated ways, but let's say uh, when you are morally responsible, you're appropriate, you're an apt candidate for certain reactive attitudes and activities based on or connected to those activities. I mean, those attitudes and punishment is one of them. So now though, you have to give the account of when punishment is justified, okay? Mm -hmm. And there are various different accounts and some of course are purely forward looking and some are not. And in the past I've um, adopted a non-consequentialist approach or a at least partly retributive approach to the justification of punishment, the the specific conditions under which punishment is justified. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I believe that the two issues are orthogonal, whether determinism is compatible with moral responsibility and whether you adopt a purely uh, forward-looking or a partly backward-looking account of responsibility. That's, that's at least the way I think of it. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I was curious because you, um, you have these kind of two remarks in your paper that are quite ambitious about um, kind of the scope of your thesis. If, if I could quote them, you say, um, I chart out different ways of articulating our inchoate conception of moral responsibility, but I do not argue that one rather than others is the correct specification. I'm not even sure there is one unique specification. In any case, I contend that my account of the conditions in which moral responsibility obtains is compatible with any of the plausible attempts to satisfy the concept, um, which is which is quite ambitious and but, but I think your remarks there clarify that there is, there's clearly a difference between sort of reactive attitudes and being a candidate for those, and then very sort of deliberative practices like punishment, you know, yes. which could be for something like deterrence sake or quarantine right. sake. Yeah. Right. So that's, yeah, that's the way I think of it. And the quote that you uh, gave, it, it raises the point that I believe that, um, we have to distinguish something like the concept of moral responsibility from the conditions of its application. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't have to put it, if you don't like concepts, uh, the language of concepts, you could say the nature or essence of moral responsibility is one thing and then it's conditions of application or another. So I think there are different Mm -hmm. concepts or different ways of specifying the concept of moral responsibility and some people term uh, do it in terms of aptness to the reactive attitudes or, and then you have to define or specify aptness some people do it in terms of dessert some to do it in terms of fittingness but anyway that would be one way of explicating or filling in the concept of moral responsibility but you'd still have to say when it applies hmm. and but another way of specifying the concept would be 
in terms of a ledger. So someone has a moral ledger means that you can make marks on it based on their actions. You can mark it on the good side or the bad side, but they have a moral ledger. And um, that's a, a metaphor for something that has to be specified non-metaphorically, but that's another way of specifying the concept of responsibility. And there are other ways. Now, one thing that's happened in contemporary philosophy following, you have Peter Strassen and then Gary Watson and then David Shoemaker and a whole bunch of other people have tried to give or have given a more articulated or uh, let's say a more complex taxonomy of the concepts of moral responsibility. But um, what I want to say is I'm not sure there is an answer to the question, what is the concept of responsibility? You have to just specify what you're talking about in a mm -hmm. given con context. But having said that, what I wanted to argue is my account of the conditions of application of responsibility of that concept is consistent with all the different particular ways of giving an account of that concept. That was my my point there. Okay. Okay. That that's actually very helpful. So, so you're sort of saying the framework that I give could be used by any of these, um, you know, different views of the concept of more responsibility. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. I like I like that actually. Well, um, yeah. And so I so I actually just recently before I read this paper, I was reading um, the importance of free will by Susan Wolf. Um, I'm I'm working my way through your uh, perspectives on more responsibility in your volume. Um, Thank you. Well, yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. And, and she, you know, one, one thing that she really kind of radically changed my mind about is the importance of, um, you know, that there's got to be some way in which we do preserve these kind of ways of relating to each other. Um, and, and she lays out, you know, a lot of interpersonal reasons, namely that, you know, how we react to each other, i.e., reactive attitudes is sort of what constitutes interpersonal life itself. And, and losing that is a, is a huge detriment, but you even um, have this additional kind of view that you, you, it's a very cool point. Like, you know, viewing ourselves as these sort of responsible free agents is what crafts the narrative to our lives. And you view that as something that's, that's very important. I take it. Yes. 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 So I agree with Susan Wolf and the point goes back at least in recent philosophy to Peter Strassen's famous article, uh, Freedom and Resentment, which I believe was published originally in 1962. And what he wanted to say is moral responsibility is defined in terms of the practices we have of holding responsible. And those practices include what he called the reactive attitudes, indignation. He gave a list, indignation, mm -hmm. resentment, um, hatred, love, gratitude. And, um, he further argued that those are crucial to treating each other, others and ourselves as persons rather than objectifying uh, each other, or for instance, mm -hmm. rather than the attitudes we would take toward a mere animal, uh, which would involve conditioning and manipulation and behavioral you know, incentives to behave one way or, or another. So he would strongly uh, he would distinguish clearly between applying negative reinforcement to an animal's behavior and positive reinforcement when the animal behaves in the way one wants. He would distinguish that from punishment, which involves an expression of indignation or resentment. Mm -hmm. Perhaps he wouldn't put it that way, but that's, that's his point. So I agree, and Susan Wolf is building on that point, that the reactive attitudes are crucial to personhood as we ordinarily think of it. Um, there's some interesting debate now, you know, for instance, Gary Watson argues that we shouldn't include certain of the retributive attitudes, specifically hatred, uh, indignation, resentment, those could be pruned, but we could still have a set of um, reactive attitudes that would be robust enough to count as moral responsibility. Uh, he follows um, Gandhi and Martin Luther King in that way. But, and there are other complexities, but I do hold the basic view that the reactive attitudes are importantly linked to personhood. And further, yes, I wanna say 
roughly, and this is uh, very rough because uh, we're going into complicated and controversial territory, but I want to say the meaning of an individual's life is her narrative, and a narrative has certain specific features, um, and one of the features is meaning holism, which means the meaning or value of one part of the narrative can depend on the meaning or value of another. So um, it's not that you just look at a particular point in the narrative and evaluate it, um, but you have to evaluate it in terms of its relationship to other parts of the narrative. Um, so, and we can go more into the details. My claim is only a creature who acts freely and is morally responsible can have a narrative with meaning holism. Uh, we could tell the story of an animal in a broad sense or describe an animal and you know who its uh, mother and father were and so forth. Um, I don't know, do you use those terms, mother and father for animals? But in any case, um, it um, you can describe its history, but it won't be a narrative. It won't have meaning holism for one thing. Um, so, that's the way I think of the uh, relationships. I think moral responsibility requires acting freely. Acting freely is sufficient for responsibility given that certain epistemic conditions are met. But, um, and so further, when you act freely, you construct part of a narrative. You write a sentence in the, the narrative of your life. And only creatures who can act freely can get meaning in that way. Okay. Yeah. So I take it that you're sort of laying out the reasoning behind, you know, what, what's like a very common intuition, I guess, of, you know, pe people might often describe a low point in their lives from the perspective of sort of a new height they reached in spite of that or something. And it's Good. this, yeah, this story of sort of, you know, self-improvement. And that's always viewed from a very agentic, standpoint tabling whether all of these kind of intrusions of that are true or not you know god's foreknowledge determinism all of those considerations right. yeah um, absolutely so and yes redemption hmm. um so you could have let's say a very difficult time in a marriage or a relationship and you could go through years of struggle and in some cases suffering struggle difficulties trying to make the relationship work now in one scenario the extension is that both partners or at least one partner learns a lot from the struggles and from those times of suffering and because of that new knowledge the um, individual changes and the marriage works out or the relationship goes very well from there on the uh, individuals live happily ever after in the <laughs> hollywood phrase we know it never quite works out perfectly but <laughs> Now, the other scenario is one in which the individuals just give up and say, this isn't going to work, and they, they go their separate ways. But then, uh, you know, just coincidentally, they each meet partners, let's say, who are uh, more simpatico or compatible <laughs> with them. So, and they're equally happy, let's say, to the individual in the first scenario. Well, um, in the first case, you could say the time, the previous time of struggle is retroactively endowed with a certain positive meaning. Um, whereas in the second scenario, that prior time is just a dead weight loss. And the individuals don't learn from it. Um, it's not as though they learn, okay, I have to find a, an individual who has these properties, but they just happen to meet someone who really works out with for them. And that means that previous time was a waste. It was a dead weight loss. It wasn't uh, okay, something that is now redeemed. It's something that the agent moved on from. And that's the kind of thing, yeah, I'm talking about. Um, another simpler example is you work really hard to get into medical school. Uh, in one case, you do get into medical school and you are happy about it. And so later you could say all that work paid off. But in another case, you don't get into medical school. 
uh, but you win the lottery or you do something, uh, you, something happens to you that makes you equally happy as you would be had you got into medical school. Now that all those years of work and studying for the MCAT and uh, doing volunteer work at the hospital, all of that is in a way a dead weight loss, you know, assuming you didn't learn something important from it, but you moved on. Now, so winning the lottery doesn't redeem or retroactively confer meaning on those years. It's just in a way a dead weight loss. So what I'm saying is if you think of agents who act freely, they can have meaning holism or their lives or the descriptions of their lives, the chronicles of their lives are really narratives um, in that they can have these relationships between the meaning of one part and meaning of another. But um, if you can't act freely, you can't have that. And I don't have any abstract a priori argument for that claim. It's just based on, in my mind, considering examples. And with a machine or a dog, you, you can't have that. And so in a dog's case, you know, maybe the master takes the dog to obedience class, trying to get it to learn certain behaviors or learn not to do certain behaviors. And then let's say the dog learns the behavior or doesn't learn the behavior. It's not as though the dog's learning or not learning endows retroactively a meaning to for the dog, a meaning for the dog or a value for the dog of that previous time in obedience school. Now, maybe it endows retrospectively uh, or retroactively increased or decreased value for the owner, I mean, or the master. The master took it to these lessons. And when the dog improves, that does mean that the master's taking the animal to the dog to obedience training has a certain value that it lacks if the dog, uh, you know, but it's not value to the dog. So that's my view, at least. It, and I mean, it, it seems psychologically intuitive. And I, and I almost, you know, I wonder, I guess I'm skeptical of um, people who claim, so, so you know, Summers, um, who I referenced before, he has, I just recently read this too, this 2007 paper called The Objective Attitude. He's kind of responding to Susan Wolf and, and he claims that no, you know, taking the objective attitude doesn't entail this loss of, of meaning at all. But I mean, you know, I, I guess I'm with you in that I don't have some sort of a priori argument for this. But psychologically, it just seems that if I were to view my entire past history in this objective sense, where it's just, you know, I'm this sort of mechanism, I'm being intruded on by these random and deterministic factors. And I've just sort of arrived at this place. I mean, yes, I can grant that theoretically that's all true, um, but it it does it it is sort of somehow alienating from your present circumstance. And your example of you know medical school is all too apt for me right now. I think I mentioned in the emails I'm applying to to PhD programs in philosophy. So, I mean, yeah, I, I could look back and you know all of this work that I've put in over the years could be worth it. If I, if I get in, and it'll be a huge disappointment if I don't. And that, I, I seem to view myself very agentically when I do that. Right, right. I think that's good. And now, let me just say, it could. let's say, hypothetically, and I doubt that this will be the case, that you don't get into a uh, grad program or a, a grad program you want to go to. It still may be that the prior time has value because you might, you might learn, you might have you know, developed your skills, you might have learned lots of stuff that, you know, helps you in later life, you have learned how to teach, uh, to think rationally and evaluate critically arguments that could help you in coding or all sorts of different things in the future. Um, but if you, if that doesn't happen, <laughs> then <laughs> hypothetically in this uh, scenario, then uh, it would be a dead weight loss. That's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> circling back around to, to your type of compatibilism that I think is, is largely motivated by retaining all of these values, which I, which I agree with, um, you, you sort of, um, you come out of, of the paper as a, as a certain type of reasons responsiveness. And you mentioned that earlier, but um, if you could, uh, this is because I, I wasn't aware of this distinction before reading this paper, could you differentiate for the audience the difference between what you call guidance control 
in moral responsibility and um uh <laughs> sorry regulative, regulative. yes regulative. regulative control so for me regulative control is the kind of control that involves various open pathways into the future so in, when you do and choose to do and do one thing if you have regulative control you had the power to do at least another thing to choose another and to do it. you had freedom to do otherwise okay. as we say and the metaphor i often use is the garden of forking paths or a branching tree-like structure you don't always have regulative control but in some at least some contexts you do it's interesting that some of the famous libertarian philosophers like Peter Van Hinwagen and Robert Kane both believe that we have freedom to do otherwise, but only in limited contexts in our lives. Mm -hmm. not, not most of the time, but only in some crucial times. You might think a libertarian believes that we always have this kind of robust kind of freedom, but not necessarily. Um, guidance control is the kind of control <clears throat> is a kind of control in which you guide your actions, your choices and actions in a reasons responsive way. And you might have both regulative and guidance control, but you might only have guidance control. Mm -hmm. And um, an example, and this is just a rough example, uh, and it has some holes in it, but <clears throat> let's say your car is functioning properly, but there is a glitch or there is a problem with the car with the steering apparatus. So you want to go, you're driving along, you want to turn right. And let's say the steering apparatus perfect works perfectly when you go right, when you turn the wheel to the right and you go right. But let's say it's broken in such a way that you don't know. But if you had tried to steer to the left, it would have forced you to go to the right anyway. There was that. Maybe it had even a safety device, a fail-safe device, such that it, you know, there was something wrong with going straight or going left, some danger that you need to avoid, so it kicks in. But let's say, again, you you do it all on your own for your own reasons. You don't even know that you couldn't have gone left. In that case, what I'd say is you guided the car. You guided the car in just the way you typically guide it when we think you are morally responsible for guiding the car or for turning it. And sometimes you could be held accountable for your driving, obviously. So, uh, but you didn't have regulative control. You only, you guided your car in the right way, but you couldn't have guided it in another way. That's, so they pull apart. And then my specific account of guidance control is acting from your own moderately reasons responsive mechanism. So you don't have to respond to mm. all the reasons that existed to do otherwise. Um, and you don't have to respond to just one, hypothetically, hypothetically. You have to, in a hypothetical set of scenarios, recognize and respond to a certain pattern of reasons. So mm. all that, my colleague, uh, Mark, uh, my former colleague, Mark Revisa, who's now a Jesuit and has just taken a position in the Vatican. Uh, sometimes I think he'll be the first American Pope. Um, <laughs> and some of the popes do uh, write philosophy books. Hmm. Um, but in any case, um, what we do in our book, Responsibility and Control, is try and flesh out these ideas of ownership of the mechanism and reasons responsive. Hmm. Yeah, and you you mentioned that the type of reasons responsiveness is a moderate sense, and you differentiate yes. that from strong and weak, where if I'm reading you correctly, strong reasons responsiveness is too stringent, I think, as you say, because it, it would necessitate a sort of one-to-one -one mapping of um, you're, you're always acting uh, with respect to the, the sort of rational reason. And that's just yeah. a, a standard that no one can adhere to. Right. Um, <clears throat> and weak has the, the converse downfall, which is that there's just sort of some scenario in which you respond to some reason, and that's just far right. too weak also. Right, exactly. So you need okay. something in between. It's like uh, Goldilocks, the Goldilocks principle, <laughs> you know, to, um, you gotta get it just right. Yeah. And, um, okay, yes, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So about the, the moderate reasons responsiveness, um, 
you you say that it's it's um where this you know an agent recognizes in this range of possible scenarios that um from a third party perspective as an understandable pattern of sufficient reasons for not doing x those exist now i was curious when you say this sort of third party perspective the way i read that is that um there would be this sort of an alignment between the person acting. Um, you know, he's got sort of a, a, a course of, of actions in front of him that he could all choose to, to do. And he is kind of mulling over the reasons for all of them, right? Now, I take it that what you're saying is that this person would align with this sort of what we might call reasonable third party, you know, table all of the questions that come along with that. Um, but that they would both perhaps agree on what would constitute a valid reason, whether or not he acts on that or not. You know, there are these sort of moral right. reasons, there's practical reasons, and, and they would agree that these are relevant, say, even though he may act in accordance with them or not. Good. Yeah. Roughly, that is maybe that's another way of putting it. And one way of thinking about it is <clears throat> animals, mere animals, are capable of acting, guiding their behavior in light of perturbations in their environment, you know, um, cues, environmental cues. Um, but they don't act in accordance with reasons because reasons have a certain, conceptually, they involve a certain kind of generality. And um, they also involve a certain context. So I have a reason not to cause you pain. Um, and I understand that pain and suffering is bad for me. And because you and I are the same in the relevant ways, I, I understand or grasp the idea that pain and suffering is bad for you. And therefore I have a reason to avoid it or not to cause it. Now that reason might get trumped or overridden by other reasons or considerations, but an animal really doesn't have the conceptual apparatus to go through that kind of reasoning okay so they act from cues and changes but not reasons now what is the general the kind of generality though that specifies or that uh, in accordance with which we'd say the agent was acting um from a reason or on the basis of reason rather than just a an environmental cause or a cue and what i want to do is following various philosophers before me, distinguish between receptivity and reactivity to reasons. Receptivity is grasping that a certain circumstance or a certain feature of a circumstance counts as a reason for mm -hmm. or against. Okay. Um, and reactivity is the idea that you choose in accordance with what you've uh, recognized as a sufficient reason or the best reason for your action. Okay, so re receptivity and reactivity. And my, the pattern that needs to be there is in the receptivity of reason. So what you do is you look at an agent's action. So let's say they the agent decides to apply for medical school. Um, and there are reasons for and against, but they could be held accountable for their decision if they do that for a reason. It might be, and probably, well, we, we could go, depending on how we fill it in, it could be a, a good reason or a bad reason, or, you know, or the agent might be um, praiseworthy or blameworthy. Let's say the individual just wants to make money, doesn't care about patients, and just wants to exploit the position to make lots of money. They can be accountable for their choice because they did it for a reason, but it's not going to be a laudatory reason. And, and of course, the reverse could be true too. But what we want to do is in that circumstance, the way Mark Revisa and I wish to specify that the reason the agent actually acted on was, or the consideration was a reason, um, you have to ask hypothetically what the, what uh, features of various hypothetical circumstances the agent would recognize as reason or grasp as reason. So what we, what we said is um, you have to look for a certain pattern that's an understandable pattern from a, a more objective perspective. 
So one uh, example could be, you know, an, an ind- you can't just count up these scenarios. So an individual might say, to switch metaphors for a second, um, I want to see a basketball game and that basketball game because it will be fun and I follow the team and so forth. And so I choose to buy the ticket, it costs $75, let's say. It's a pro game, costs 75 But now you could ask, um, would I recognize as a good reason not to buy the ticket that it would cost $1,000? And maybe I'd say yes. Yeah. But now, hypothetically, you could ask, would I recognize it as, as a good reason not to buy the ticket if the ticket costs $1,200? Maybe I'll say no. Mm-hmm. And nothing else changes. That begins to suggest that it's not an understandable or rational pattern of recognitions of reason. And if it goes all over the place in that random way, you don't have genuine reasons receptivity. So you don't just grasp or understand one thing as a reason to do otherwise. You don't have to grasp all reasons to do otherwise, but you have to understand what counts as reasons in a certain kind of pattern. Now, we left it at that. And I'd I'd love to be able to say more about that pattern. Um, And I I think it has to do with narrativity that the I mean understandability is in part um, is it's in part rationality of the sort I just mentioned that um, if a thousand dollars per ticket is a reason not to buy it then 1200 should be as well on 13 and 15 but not necessarily 900 or 700 mm-hmm. depending on how rich you are <laughs> and believe me people pay that to go to the super bowl easily oh easily. Um, yeah so anyway um that's what mm. i'm getting at but i don't know how to bring in i mean i'd like to say that the pattern of recognition of reasons has to fit mm. with the agent's narrative in some way and a third party has to be able to see it as such but I've never really put that on paper and thought it through. Yeah. And I am, I must admit, let me say one other thing. I'm sometimes skeptical about the promiscuous, you could say, invocation of the idea of narrative. I mean, it's very, you know, uh, popular or uh, it's a, an idea that you see out there, okay, that this or that is analyzed in terms of narrativity and then things stop. I don't want to do that. So I have to be very careful. Okay. It would, what you said is so interesting though, because it would seem, I I totally catch the intuition that it would seem extremely weird. um, If it wasn't also in keeping your recognition of those reasons, your receptivity to them wasn't in keeping with who you have been in the past. Also, it would be extremely strange if I've always been fiscally conservative, for instance, and I've never spent, you know, more than $50 on some sports outing. And then all of a sudden I'm willing to just chalk up a thousand dollars to go right. to a given Steelers game, for instance. Right. Or if you've always been extremely frugal and um, you, you do choose to go uh, pay $50 or, you know, whatever it is, mm. but that you would then recognize as a reason you would not recognize a reason not to purchase the ticket if it cost a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars now that could make sense right if you're a very wealthy person who was very devoted to the sports team or you want to network at the lakers game or the (laughs) super bowl or whatever that would make sense but if you've always been frugal and you don't have money really doesn't make sense now we do sometimes act out of character that's true but, and that is true, but usually we can find some reason that might not fit with the past character um, to explain the behavior. But when it's totally inexplicable um, in terms of the agent's narrative, then it at least raises questions as to whether it really is robustly acting on a reason. I agree. And, um, Let's say, 
So for instance, I think an example I used in my original paper on reasons responsiveness, this was I think published in 1987. Um, it was called Responsiveness and Moral Responsibility. Um, of course, it could have been called Moral Responsibility and Reasons Responsibility. <laughs> those words are in there. Um, what I said was you could imagine, and th this is actually an example that was given to me by the editor of the volume, Ferdinand Schoeman. I thought it was a good example. And so there was an actual case in uh, New York in which, this was a long time ago, uh, mid eighties, in which someone used a saber to kill someone on the Staten Island Ferry, <laughs> the saber killer on the Staten Island Ferry. And I, I wanted to say though, that these weren't the actual circumstances. Let's say we found out that the saber killer, let's say it was a male, uh, he did it because he, uh, his reason was that this other individual in the saber killer's mind was a spy, a Russian spy. And because of that, it was justified um, or that counted as a good reason to kill him. Uh, but now let's say, hypothetically, the, the killer wouldn't have killed the others, if the other, if the other were eating a Snickers bar, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, or, you know, if the other were smoking a cigarette, well, then he wouldn't have killed, it just makes no sense. So the, uh, but let's say, if hypothetically, the killed individual, the thought to be spy individual, were smoking a cigarette, then the individual, uh, the killer would still kill, uh, would still rec would recognize um, his putative spyhood as a good reason. Now, this is not a rational pattern at all, uh, but there exists a reason, uh, you know, a scenario in which a different condition would obtain, i.e. the individual would be smoking, in which the killer recognizes that as a reason. Now, in any case, um, that might not be the way I've presented it the best example, because perhaps what you'd want is, um, let's say it's a good reason, um, objectively, that the, that the killer would recognize. So um, let's say the killer would not kill and would, and would recognize as a reason not to kill that he suddenly re recognizes that his superiors might have made a mistake in who was a spy. Uh, so if he recognizes that as a reason not to kill, but he, but he um, also uh, recognizes, or he doesn't recognize some other good reasons and does recognize or, or grasp the notion that if the individual were smoking a cigarette, then he wouldn't choose to kill. Mm. All right, so that's a weird pattern. It's weird content-wise and pattern-wise. And we wanted to move away then from weak reasons responsiveness to something not so strong as total strong reasons responsiveness, but in between. And one further note is Robert Nozick on which uh, a good deal of my own account of responsibility was patterned, gave this view according to which um, someone is um, not so much responsible, but tracking value. Um, and the account involves this tight connection with value so that if, um, if there had been a good reason to do otherwise, the agent would have recognized that reason. Definitely, and that is a stronger notion than what I want. But part of the explanation of the divergence between Nozick and me and me and Mark Revisa is that he's really giving an account of a certain kind of goodness, moral, being a, an exemplary moral agent is tracking value. But we're giving an account of moral responsibility. And obviously you could be morally responsible even though you don't track value. Otherwise, we would never hold people accountable for wrong actions. So anyway. It seems extremely valuable and important about your view also, this, this ability to sort of update once you know 
uh, the the agent's reasons for what they've done. And you point out, you know, there's this divide between kind of actions and reasons for it in, in what you just said. So even with, I mean, you know, you were you said it could be an absurd reason why the, the killer wouldn't um, kill him if he were smoking a cigarette, like in and of itself, that's a weird reason. Right. But but the the killer could then kind of illuminate your confusion there and say, oh, no, well, there was actually a gasoline leak on the boat. And if I were to kill him while he were smoking, it would kill hundreds of you know innocent bystanders as Got the it. boat goes up in flames, something like that. Very so good. so it's I'm almost wondering then, are there sort of I, I, I wonder if there are almost two types of 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 conditions for reasons responsiveness, namely that it's logic, rational from a third party perspective i.e., you know, you and I as rational agents agree, that's actually a good reason to at least recognize. Um, and there might even be scenarios in which, no, this person's so heinous that they need to be killed in spite of the cost, you know. Um, but also that that reason is in adherence with who he has been, rationally speaking, as a person. Do, do you see that sort of third party and yeah. then self um, narrative as two different conditions or are they, are they similar to you? I think that um, when we, so it's interesting, you're right. Um, sometimes philosophers employ the idea for different, various different purposes of seeing yourself as an agent and seeing yourself as having a certain kind of narrative. This is a really strong narrative view. So <clears throat> someone might say you're morally responsible only if, or if and only if you act in accordance with how you see yourself, how you see your narrative going, or even from a third party perspective, what we have to do in evaluating someone's moral responsibility, what we have to do is look at its, his story or her story and make sure that choice is in accordance with that uh, narrative. But that's too strong in my view um, because we can act out of character and still be morally responsible. But what is important, I think, is in order to be responsible, an agent has to be reasons responsive. And that means the agent has to meet a certain condition that involves recognition of reasons or recognition in a, <clears throat> a set of scenarios that count as understandable or graspable by a third party more objectively. So. Um, in an interesting article called, <clears throat> excuse me, Against Narrativity, <clears throat> Peter Strassen's son, Galen Strassen, who is a philosopher at, <clears throat> now at the University of Texas, excuse me. Austin, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'm familiar with this paper, but, but right. continue. He argues against the idea that we can use the notion of narrativity in this strong way to illuminate moral responsibility. So it's not as though we have to see ourselves as having a certain narrative or a story or that someone else has to make sure that our choices and actions are in accordance with that developing story. That's not what I want to say. What I want to say is when you're responsible, you're writing a, story, a sentence in the narrative of your life and therefore you're endowing that the description or chronicle of your life with meaning holism. That's the idea that I want to invoke. So I want to home in on a specific feature of narrativity, meaning holism. And I want to say a condition on moral responsibility is that you have to be the sort of creature that endows, you know, that does, um, as it were, have that feature um, whose life has that feature of meaning holism and that's got in virtue of activity. So the connection that Galen Strassen sees in that many philosophers make is not the one I want to make. Okay. That's super interesting. I wanted to ask you about the, the second part of the, the conditions for guidance control. The, the first is the moderate reasons responsiveness and the second is the mechanism ownership. Right. Um, which I, I think you talk about a little bit less in this in this paper specifically, but it's it's super interesting because it comes up in other papers that I've read a, a lot. And yeah. so, yeah, maybe if you could just just say a word about what you mean by um, ownership of, of the mechanism. Right. So it has to be intuitively your own mechanism and not 
a, sci a neuroscientist and a mm -hmm. various neurosurgeons mechanism. Um, so someone could have, let's say, inserted a chip in your brain secretly so that that individual is um, using that chip to manipulate you, to cause you to choose and, be and behave in the way that neurosurgeon or that other person wants you to. And uh, might not be available to you in consciousness, might not phenomenologically present itself. And that's just one way in which such manipulation could be done. And, uh, and then that you could say intuitively or in terms of the language of the Revisa Fisher approach, um, the other individual can uh, put in place a, a moderately reasons responsive mechanism. Mm. So that's a problem for our view. So it can't be just action from a morally uh, from a reasons responsive mechanism. It has to be your own, not the scientist. Mm. Okay. So now, if you think about the Frankfurt cases that uh, we haven't really talked about, the Frankfurt cases are cases in which intuitively an agent acts freely but would have been caused let's say by an evil scientist to choose and do what they actually ch chose and do and done in a hypothetical scenario had the agent been about to choose otherwise they would have been forced to by a direct manipulation of the brain forced to choose and do what they actually did my analysis of that is the agent is acting freely because they are acting from their own appropriately reasons responsive mechanism in the actual sequence. Now in the hypothetical case, a different mechanism would have kicked in. It would mm -hmm. not have been the agent's own mechanism. So in the alternative sequence, the agent wouldn't have been responsible. But in the actual sequence, though the agent herself lacks regulative control, couldn't have done otherwise, nevertheless, she exhibits guidance control. So that was that went by fast but that's kind of maybe to motivate the idea that it has to be the agent's own mechanism and what you do then is you fix on the actual sequence mechanism not the mechanisms or that would have operated in other scenarios and you just kind of ask whether that kind of mechanism was appropriately reasons responsible mm -hmm. that's our approach it's called i like to call it an actual sequence model of moral responsibility. Now, others have picked up that term and developed very sophisticated, more sophisticated than mine, uh, accounts, uh, actual sequence accounts. And one such person is Carolina Sartorio at the University of Arizona. But um, back in 1982, I began charting out the possibility of an actual sequence approach to moral responsibility, following, of course, the lead of Harry Frankfurt, and then even going back to John Locke and previous, and Bishop Bramhall and Chrysippus even, who Chrysippus talked about a man running along with a dog on a long leash, and the dog happily skips along or runs along, but if the dog had tried to sit or, or go in a different direction, the leash would have pulled it, but the dog didn't want to sit or go, so in other words, of course, the dog's not an age, but well, all I'm saying is my view doesn't come out of nowhere. It's not totally original or substantially original. I'm following an actual sequence tradition. Then in contemporary philosophy, it gets developed further. Mm -hmm. And just to, to kind of uh, hearken back on that, on that important, um, you know, there, there's still the ability to evaluate the type of person under these scenarios, because, you know, in, in your paper, you list, uh, you know, someone's about to vote in the, I forget if it was the 2008 election, but, but, you know, they were going to vote for <clears throat> Obama and there was a, a chip implanted in their brain being controlled by this third party. And if they had chosen to vote for Bush um, or uh, McCain or whoever it was at that point, um, they would have intervened and the person would have chosen to vote for Obama. And, <clears throat> you know, you might say, you know, wow, this this person was regulatively not free because they were going to vote for Obama either way. But but the important distinction that you retain is that, well, look, in one scenario, they're a Democrat and the other, they're a Republican, even though either way, they're going to vote for Obama. And that's how I I take it that the kind of evaluations about about persons and their character is is preserved. 
Um, well, what I would want to say more specifically is in the actual state, the agent is a Democrat, hmm. but in the actual sequence, she votes for the Democrat for her own reasons. She's hmm. she's not being manipulated. She uses the ordinary uh, human capacity for uh, practical reasoning, which involves deliberating, recognizing reasons, deliberating, acting in accordance, at least the capacity to act in accordance with what one deems the best reason. So she's responsible for voting for the Democrat. Um, but um, in the alternative scenario, although she's still a Democrat, she doesn't act from the ordinary capacity for practical reasoning. It's not her mechanism. It's a manipulation mechanism, or it's the scientist mechanism. So um, that's why she's responsible. She in the you fix on the actual sequence mechanism, but nevertheless, uh, she couldn't have done otherwise. That's the way. So maybe I would not say she is a Democrat in one scenario and she isn't in another. But what I'd say is she acts from her own mechanism in one, but not in the other. And responsibility is a matter of looking at the properties, even if they're dispositional properties of the actual sequence. So uh, I think you bring up a good point and um, I just wanna specify a little, when I say an actual sequence theory, I'm looking for reasons responsiveness and what we've, uh, responsiveness is really a dispositional or a modal idea and I've been characterizing it in terms of alternative scenarios. So alternative scenarios are still relevant on my view, but they're relevant in virtue of their relation to the responsiveness or a modal property of the actual sequence. Mm -hmm. um, they're not relevant in virtue of pointing to the presence or lack of freedom to do otherwise. So now you could distinguish, and I did in my 1987 paper between a strongly and a weakly actual sequence view. A weak, I have a weakly actual sequence view in the sense that I allow for modal or dispositional properties, which then get cashed out in terms of alternative scenarios. But you could have a strong view according to which you have, you look only at non-dispositional, i.e. categorical properties of the actual sequence. And that would be a stronger view. And it turns out um, Carolina Sartorio's view is more like that. Um, so hers is a purer, you could say. Well, I don't <laughs> know, but a certain uh, kind of distinctive, strong view about the relationship between alternative possibilities or alternative scenarios and moral responsibility. So you mm -hmm. could have a spectrum. Uh, you know, on one end, responsibility requires regulative control or freedom to choose and do otherwise. Then in the middle, you have my view that responsibility requires not regulative, but guidance control, but guidance control is defined in terms of dispositional properties mm. um, in part of the actual sequence mechanism. And then you could have Carolina's view according to which no regulative control is required. You just look at the responsiveness uh, portfolio or characteristics of the actual sequence but you're not looking to alternative scenarios at all in any way. So anyway, that's mm -hmm. an interesting, or that's a spectrum you could say. And, and if I understand your view correctly, I, I know we're coming up on an hour, so I'm going to be mindful of your time, but um, just, just maybe to wrap it up with this. So, so that I take it as sort of how you get to what you say is a strong point of your view, which is that, you know, our status as agents doesn't hang on a thread um, because this, the, the relevance of alternative um, possibilities isn't necessarily sort of, you might say it's not a metaphysical point. It's more of a point with respect to the person's reasoning ability, their reasons, responsiveness, the receptivity to right. all of these, you know, possible um, reasons for acting differently than they do. Right, exactly. I mean, one of my mantras is responsibility should not hang on a thread or shouldn't be fragile in that way, in a certain specific way. And specifically, of course, it does hang on whether an agent has the relevant psychological path capacity. So a psych um, psychopath, for instance, arguably can't recognize certain reasons to do or not to do a certain act. So they can't grasp 
the fact that your suffering is a reason for me not to do a certain thing. Um, they just can't empathize in that way. And maybe um, they don't have um, the relevant capacities, the capacities required for moral responsibility. So responsibility does depend on certain empirical features of the agent. Um, and even, but and I can also say if in the future we really establish the idea that people aren't responding to reasons, but they are just responding to features of their situation as the situation, as the uh, doctrine of situationism uh, implies, or at least suggests, then I would say agents aren't responsible. We'd all be in a relevant, in a certain way, like psychopaths, we wouldn't be responsible. So in a sense, responsibility hangs on a thread but not in the way I have in the mind. It doesn't matter for our responsibility whether causal determinism is true or not. Mm. It doesn't matter whether there is a God who has foreknowledge or not. Um, and that's why, and I think it would be really implausible and unfortunate to have a theory uh, by reference to which, or uh, which implies that if we woke up one day to the headline in the New York Times uh, or the LA Times or you know whatever newspaper you read, people don't read newspapers anymore. But if you look <laughs> on your Facebook feed or wherever it is, or you know you pull it up on uh, CNN and you say uh, you see a headline: causal determinism is true, uh, and you know you read and they talk about a consortium of scientists from all the top universities and they have. Um, come to the conclusion that causal determinism is true, um, eh, you probably wouldn't change anything right away. But if over the next few years, you, you reflect and you read the literature and it really is very plausible that causal determinism is true, I don't think you should have to give up personhood or your view that others and you are distinctively persons that are deeply different from mere animals. I don't think responsibility should hang on that thread. Now it would if determinism rolled out freedom to do otherwise and you needed freedom to do otherwise to be responsible. But the whole approach I wanna take is an actual series. So we don't need that kind of freedom. And so causal determinism doesn't threaten our responsibility by threatening freedom to do otherwise. Now, people have pointed out and I recognize this in 1981 and, or 1982 in my first paper on these subjects, um, I um, recognize that that in itself, the fact that we don't need freedom to do other, that in itself does not show that determinism is consistent with responsibility because you could have the sourcehood to worry. You could worry that determinism mm -hmm. threatens responsibility, not in virtue of considerations about alternative possibilities, but in virtue of considerations about the source of my, my action. Mm -hmm. um, but my overall mantra, as I said, is that, you know, our views of ourselves as persons and our being in an important web of interpersonal relationships and being subject to uh, moral assessments, good, bad, right, wrong, courageous, um, and so forth, uh, courageous and cowardly, um, being accessible to those kinds of judgments and being part of this network of interpersonal uh, reactive attitudes is deeply important to us as human beings. Peter Strassen suggested, or I think explicitly states basically that we couldn't understand ourselves as persons or human beings um, if we gave up all of those uh, reactive attitudes and that framework. Um, I would say at least it's extremely central to our views of ourselves. And so I don't think we would or should be required to give up that whole framework um, if we, uh, you know, based on the deliverances of theoretical physicists, you know, the, on one day, the physicists think, oh, these equations don't fit together totally. And we believe in quantum mechanics. And we believe that quantum mechanics shows that at a fundamental level, everything's indeterministic, or at least there are gaps in deterministic causation. 
Then the next day they figure out, well, that was just a result of epistemic limitations. Now we see that determinism is true. Why would we flip, you could say, from no uh, from responsibility to no responsibility? It doesn't make any sense to me. So to me, that doesn't show that semi-compatibilism is true, but what it shows is that we should work hard theoretically we should be inclined to seek a compatibilist view. Yep. Mm, that's a great place to end on. And it's all super interesting. So if people um, want to find out more about your work, well, I've you know suggested this paper specifically, but where could people go to find out more generally about your work? Okay, I will send you a link. Um, I hope you could post it or make it available to you. I have a link to a set of my papers on free will and books on free will, but also other topics like uh, death and immortality and meaning in life. And it also has a section with interviews and podcasts. Hmm. Um, and so I'll send it to you and, and people could look at it. Um, there is, though, if you want to know a good single place to get a summary of my overall views about moral responsibility, there's a book that I edited along with three others called uh, Four Views on Free Will. It's published by Blackwell. There it is, Four yep. Views of, or on Free Will. It's um, a good place because we, are, we were asked to present our view in an overview way and also a way that's um, brief enough and kind of accessible enough to be helpful to a general audience or at least to a a philosophical argue, uh, audience that involving people who aren't specialists in this field. So um, those are the two things. Uh, my, um, I'll send you that hyperlink basically because it has a list of papers, and for most of those papers, I you know you can click on a link to that specific paper. But mm. to get a, a simpler overview, the four views on free will, my contribution would be helpful. Excellent. Excellent. Well, John, stay on the line for a second, if you could, but thank you so much for doing this. This was amazing. Okay, well, thank you for having me. And I, I really appreciate it. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, John was a dream guest of mine. It's, it's really amazing to be able to actually speak with a philosopher whose work I'm citing in um, my writing sample, but even, you know, more, uh, expanded ideas um, that I'm, I'm jotting down on paper about moral responsibility. So this was an amazing episode for me. And I really enjoyed the conversation. I thought John had a lot of um, really kind of unique and interesting things to say about the topics of moral responsibility and free will and determinism. So I will leave links in the description to uh, both the, the sources of the papers that John recommended and uh, the link to his personal website. If you want to support this show, you can do so by sharing it on Twitter or on social media. You can rate it on Apple Podcasts. You can like this video or subscribe via YouTube or your RSS feed. You can discuss it on your own show and link back to this one. And you can also connect me with guests or recommend uh, topics to cover. And you can do so uh, at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers. And as always, thanks for listening and keep struggling to escape the cave. <laughs>